Good evening. I am Amel Zarouk, an associate publisher at Just World Books, a small independent publishing company. And this International Women's Day, I'm honored to moderate this important conversation on the role of women in South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle and the transnational and transgenerational connections that can be drawn from their activism. Today, we will be centering our conversation around the heroines whose stories make up the book Women Surviving Apartheid's Prisons by South African journalist Shantini Naidu. Shantini is coming to us from Johannesburg. Thank you for being with us, Shantini. Thanks for having me, Amel. Women Surviving Apartheid's Prisons is a profile of the four heroines of the South African anti-apartheid struggle and documents their significant contributions to a democratic South Africa and their resiliency in the face of incarceration and torture. Sadly, like many women who led and grew resistance movements, their stories have long gone untold. So that is why this International Women's Day, I feel very humbled to be a part of this conversation on the contributions of these revolutionary women and the movements they have set in motion. If you're joining us from the DMV, you can pick up a copy either at the Busboys and Poets 14th and V or Tacoma Park. Otherwise, you can order a copy from Busboys and Poets on bookshop.org. And thank you to Busboys and Poets for hosting this space and for creating a reflective and supportive atmosphere. Also with us is Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons, a veteran of the US civil rights and black power movements. Zahara is an assistant professor of religion at the University of Florida and has a long history in the area of civil rights, human rights, and peace work. As a college student at Spelman College, Zohara was active with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, and spent seven years working full-time on voter registration and desegregation activities during the height of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Later, she worked for 23 years on the staff of the American Friends Service Committee. And it's such a pleasure to have you with, with here. Thank you also, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And also with us is longtime racial justice, labor, and international activist Bill Fletcher Jr. Bill is the former president of Trans Africa, a senior scholar with the Institute for Policy Studies, and has served in leadership positions with many prominent union and labor organizations, including the AFL CIO and the Service Employees International Union, and has authored and co authored several books. And we're very grateful to have you with us. Amel, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we're going to open this discussion by introducing you first to the four heroines that this book is centered around, after which we'll move into a broader conversation on the role of women in liberation movements in the South African and international anti-apartheid movements and in the U.S. civil rights movement. And towards the end of tonight's event, we will be taking questions from the audience, so please submit them through the comments. Uh, so, Shantani, if you'd like to introduce us to our first heroine. Wow, it's so wonderful to see. Um, this is a picture from 1969 or 1970, um, when I believe um, Joyce Sikakani Rankin, um, who was a journalist at the time, uh, now retired and um, living in Johannesburg, um, was leaving into exile, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but Joyce Sikakane Rankin was, um, as I said, a journalist who was one of the women who was detained in this trial, um, with, along with Winnie Mandela and um, the three other remaining women who are still alive and who still live in South Africa. So Joyce grew up in Soweto, um, from in a prominent ANC family, and she became involved in activism when she was very young, uh, probably in uh, as a as a child. And um, she's an award-winning author and journalist. And she worked at the World Newspaper, Drum Magazine, and the Rand Daily Mail at the height of the resistance struggle. It was part of the reason that she was um, detained. Um, if I can quickly read uh, an excerpt from Joyce's contribution to the story. In the early hours of the morning in May 1969, not two weeks after her engagement was sealed, the security branch came for Joyce. 
five armed officers stormed into her mother's home in Soweto and arrested her. The move she believes had everything to do with her upcoming marriage, which was in contravention of the Immort Immorality Act, which then prevented interracial marriage. They said I was a terrorist because I was an investigative journalist for a Johannesburg morning paper. And I endeavored to inform the world about the brutal effects of apartheid on the black South African communities. After working hours, I attended to the welfare and educational needs of political prisoners and their families. Both work has been done in full glare of the public scrutiny. But like jackals hunting at daybreak, they had to claim a pound of flesh on those of us who were determined to expose the naked brutality of the apartheid system. Joyce knew that her journalism attracted attention and that her missionary work collecting funds around the country was considered a crime, but not that it would be as unforgivable as the regime made it out to be. The 2 a.m. wake up was rude and unpleasant. She said, by pouncing on you in a deep sleep, they meant to deprive you of a vital orderly function. They started the anxiety machine immediately and your trauma began at 2 a.m. As the five special branch officers at gunpoint whisked me away at dawn from my mother's house to the solitary cell via the death row cells and Pretoria Central, I was convinced I would die in their hands, leaving my three-year-old an, orph an orphan. Thank you, Shantini. And Zohara, could I ask you to introduce us to Rita and Zanga? Yes, it's my pleasure. Um, Rita Nzanga uh, and her family lived in Sophia Town, uh, which was a dynamic um, melting pot of race and ethnicities. The community celebrated Chinese New Year, the Hindu festival of Diwali, as well as Christian holidays. Uh, Rita's family was Anglican. Um, the community was really idyllic and idealistic and obviously in a racist uh, South African uh, led government, it was too uh, idealistic. In 1955, 2000 heavily armed police moved into Sophia town and began separating and segregating the community into ethnic groups. The residents resisted, they protested, but it was to no avail. Sophia Town was flattened uh, and wiped off the Johannesburg map. Uh, and so it became a white Afrikaans suburb. Uh, this really was the beginning of Rita's understanding of the injustices of the South African system. Uh, she began her activism as a labor union organizer and doing that was enough to put you on state's surveillance list. She and her husband moved to Soweto. Uh, she met Joyce Sikakani and Winnie Mandela in Soweto and they became actively involved in setting up a local ANC branch. Um, she was arrested and I want to read uh, her description of the arrest, uh, just a brief part of that description. In the early hours of 12 May, 1969, Rita and Lawrence were forced awake by banging on their doors and windows with the police dogs, large Alsatians with gnashing teeth and bright flashing lights through windows. The children were roused from sleep. The police proceeded over several hours to search the house with little regard for the terrified screams of their four children. In the end, they confiscated books, private letters, newspaper cuttings, and photos 
which had nothing to do with politics, or if they were political, were not illegal. None of these items were ever returned. Uh, continuing, she talks about how they were taken into detention and would remain in solitary confinement with no news from or about their children. Uh, she goes on to tell us that she was kept for six weeks in the clothes that she had been arrested in and was not given any word of her four young children. And this torments her to this day, just thinking about her young children being left behind as they were driven away in police vans. So I salute Rita Nzanga. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have Shanti Naidu, who is of no relation to our author uh, and who grew up near Johannesburg's inner city in a highly politicized family. In fact, it was said that the Naidu children didn't play house, they played meetings. Um, as a young mother, she was involved in coalition building within the anti-apartheid movement and often went door to door, young child in hand, uh, bringing awareness to the different causes that she was organizing around. In 1960, she was served with a five-year banning order meant to severely restrict her movements. But despite this, she continued to work as a trade unionist and helped distribute contraband materials up until her second arrest in 1969. And I, I have a, a short passage to read as well. So the security branch came for her on the 13th of June, 1969 a few weeks after she'd read about Winnie, Rita, and Joyce's detention. I was in bed in Rocky Street. They came in and in front of my mother said, pack your bags, we are detaining you under the Terrorism Act. I didn't think I was a terrorist. Then again, your life is political activism and I knew that Joyce, Winnie, and Rita were detained a month or so before me. It was in the papers. We later found out that they went to our neighbors. They saw who was coming and going to the house. She wasn't told why she was being arrested or given any notice on what was going to happen. I packed a few things, grabbed an extra dress too, underwear. It was winter. I took my overcoat with me, luckily. It was so cold on the cement floor. I eventually used it as a pillow. She was not afraid, but worried about her mother not knowing where she was headed. One could disappear in the cells without contact with the outside world. Solitary confinement is terrible, terrible. Shanti stresses the point by squeezing the tissue in her hands. Sometimes I would think they had better interrogate me. At least there was contact. I didn't have anything to read or anything of the sort. You exhaust yourself, you do your exercise. You can't sleep, so you want to make yourself really tired. I would march and march and I would do my prayers in the morning. And she is still a practicing Hindu. And this was how Joyce, Nandwe, and Marita knew Shanti was nearby. Joyce had chuckled when she told me she would make a noise, Shanti, singing her prayers early, early in the morning. They, the wardens, would tell her to be quiet, but she didn't. And I, I was just so struck by the, the steadfastness she proved of having already received threats from the apartheid regime, a, a banning order, harassment, and an arrest, and that she continued in her mobilizing and, and wasn't in any way intimidated. Um, just such determination. Yes. Now, Shanti, back to you. Shantini. Thanks, Amel. That happens a lot. <laughs> um, the last um, brave woman in this trial um, was Manonwe Mankashla. Manonwe grew up in the southern part of um, South Africa called Port Elizabeth, which in the 1950s and 60s was a bustling hub of anti apartheid activism. The ANC leader, Govan Mbeki, known as Uam Gov, lived and worked there, as did the Black Consciousness leader, Steve Biko. So um, Manonwe found employment in the printing and publishing company that was producing um, 
pro ANC or African National Congress newspapers called New Age Fighting Talk and the Pondo Revolt. It was another illegal act under the apartheid laws. Um, the subscribers to the newspaper were multiracial across the city. She says, but they could not collect the paper because they did not want to be seen. What would happen is that I would be given the new age and a list of people I should deliver to them quietly. Every week I would take the paper to town to people who are distributing it. The newspaper was used as a messenger service between banned people. She says there was a Chinese grocer who sold the paper for us and an Indian man who had a barber shop who distributed from there. They were also ANC members. From the barber shop, I would come back with a fruit parcel to give to Om Gov, the ANC leader. It would be an apple or banana, but hidden in this fruit um, was, an, was something. Um, she means a note. I didn't have a problem because I was carrying a fruit basket and my papers, so the police were not paying any attention to me. As the newspapers were, born, were banned, others were created and Nondwe remained a messenger for 10 years. We carried on focusing on the townships, playing hide and seek, she laughs. In, in 1962, Orm Gov and others disappeared. I was alone in the ANC office with a few people from the textile and food and canning workers unions. There was a policeman who was watching us. He saw me on the bus one day and he said, you're always hiding, today I'm arresting you. She wasn't given a chance to go home to collect clothing or to tell her mother and children that she was being detained. And of course, she went on to be detained for nearly two years. Uh, thank you, Shantani. I, I'd love it if you could offer some insight into the origins of this project and you know the, the journey that you and this book have been on. It's amazing. I'm actually, I'm so privileged to be here with um, all of you today, especially um, Bill and uh, Dr. Simmons, you know, to to have such stalwarts in your own um, activism uh, in the US speaking about the story, which was a really unknown story from 1969. And I came across it while I was reporting on Winnie Mandela's death. And of course, Winnie Mandela being an international figure, um, the wife of Nelson Mandela, who'd, um, who'd played a central part in our um, struggle for democracy. Um, what we didn't know though, was that she was surrounded by groups of women, um, including this one, which were um, her friends and even those who were not known to her but were still dedicated to the cause, like Manwandwe, who lived in the Eastern Cape, which is on the other end of the country from Johannesburg. So um, at the time of her passing, I had gone to the prison to visit her cell um, to write a story about the, the experience there. And of course, the cell was demolished and there wasn't, solitary confinement doesn't exist in, in South Africa really anymore. So um, at the same time, I came across this trial of, it was called the trial of 22 in 1969, which was the trial that led to her detention. Um, but I'd found that there were seven women in total in that trial um, and two had passed on, the other four we've just spoken about now. And very interestingly, um, when Winnie Mandela died, um, these women came forward to her funeral. They were interviewed briefly in, in media and Marita spoke at, at the funeral. And I thought these were her friends and comrades. I, can't, I wanted to know more about their prison experience. What was it like? And, and also to, um, to work out what they'd been doing for in the last 50 years because I'd, I'd found them in, in around 2018. And um, it was interesting to me the way that firstly Winnie Mandela was portrayed when she died and the way that the narrative changed around her death, you know, from reporting um, on, on her as a, you know, as a militant, as a person who'd fallen off the rails and, and so forth, and, and, who'd, and where they'd been glossing over of her actual um, story as a mother, as an activist, as um, 
you know, the wife of, of a, a leader who was in prison for nearly three decades, you know, Nelson Mandela was in um, prison for, for 27 years. And the impact that that had on her was almost overlooked. She was ma- ex- expected to be, um, you know, um, to continue as uh, any regular person, yet her, you know, it was a daily struggle for that long period. So I was interested in the mental health aspects um, and particularly because her uh, mental health um, came into question around the time of her death as well and we couldn't ask her the questions. So I wanted to ask these questions of the women in, in, who were in the trial with her and it turned out that their stories were absolutely amazing. The impact on their, on their lives, on their children, their bravery, um, you know, their turn, their exile, all of it was really, really just fascinating, which um, developed into a bigger body of work, my thesis at a, a university here in South Africa. And, um, and from there um, was, you know, uh, we knew we couldn't contain the story and I was approached to, to, to produce a book from their lives. Thank you. And so what is the, the current status of, of these women heroines of the South African freedom movement in this book and, and beyond? Well, they were very quietly, even at the time that I met them in retirement, um, you know, you wouldn't have known them if you passed them in the street. And this is the thing that I found so fascinating about them is that they were they they were really part of a very significant trial. Um, if you just to give you some context, it was the trial that happened six years after the Ravonia trial, which was the the big trial that put all the male leadership either, either into prison or in in or into exile, more or less. And um, uh, Manonwe talks about how she was left behind. There was a scaffolding of the movement that was left behind to continue with the work. And these were the women in it. Um, they were um, part of the the the, the broader um, sort of community that was left behind to um, to keep the struggle going, which was over a very, very long period. So um, I suppose their contribution, they felt to be so, um, you know, selfless that they went about their, the rest of their lives very quietly and very without fanfare and without people knowing about what they were doing. So um, I had to literally sit down and, and meet them for tea to, to see, uh, for them to share their story, which they, they still don't believe is remarkable. But um, hearing you all speak about it now, it really makes me realize how important their contribution was. Do you feel that this erasure, this erasure is changing in South Africa as it kind of is in the US? I think absolutely. You know, um, International Women's Day, for instance, is such an important event around the world. Um, you know, and this relates a lot to, I'm sure, Bill's work in, in, with around unions and working women and, and, you know, looking at class struggles and how um, even today we have it's such a huge gap in unpaid work in the world. And I think the difference now is particularly with social media and there's a, there's a, a feeling of activism again in the world. I, you, you guys have experienced it very much in the US in the last few um, weeks, I would say. And um, I think it is correcting itself, but there's still a lot more to be done. Thank you. I'd like to bring Zohara into this. I was uh, wondering if you could speak on your experiences as as one of the few, you know, women project leaders when you were uh, involved in SNCC. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yes, um, I was one of three, I believe, uh, women project directors in Mississippi uh, during the 1964 Mississippi summer project and beyond. Uh, so, you know, this was 1964. Uh, we still had a uh, uh, heavy emphasis on male leadership. And uh, it's only now, you know, in the last, I would say decade uh, or less that we're hearing about a lot of our women leaders 
in my case, uh, I really found that I had to confront quite a bit of sexism. Uh, and um, one of the things that uh, really became sort of a bullseye against me was that I had said and put forth the idea that women were not to be harassed uh, on the project by male project members. And so you had to sign a document agreeing to that. Uh, and during the summer, you know, we had lots of volunteers and there was grumbling, but they, they did it. And most of them uh, left at the end of the summer and left uh, myself and two other women who had been volunteers, but who had decided like myself to stay at the end of the summer because our work was far from completed. And little did I know, you know, that many of my male comrades had heard about this uh, uh, pledge not to engage in sexual harassment. So they said, we're not going there to work with those women. Uh, you know, and they started calling us the Amazon Project. So, you know, clearly uh, women have had to struggle uh, very much like our sisters in South Africa against uh, the racist systems that we're trying to overthrow. And we have the internal struggles we have had and continue to have in many places, uh, the struggle with our comrades. Uh, who we have to convince that we are leaders and that we are able to direct projects and that we have every right to demand that we be treated with respect and not be sexually harassed. So uh, I think things are changing. And of course, we know now with the Black Lives Matter and so many of our other organizations, women are in the leadership we know their names, uh, they're out front. So I'm so happy that things are changing from when I started out as a movement activist in the early 60s. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know you keep saying things are changing. Can you speak on how you felt or heard that change? Well, I mean, as a person who has been in the movement for 60 odd years, I'm still, you know, active and I'm uh, playing more of a role of uh, telling the younger activists uh, a lot of the things that we did uh, through the SNCC Legacy Project and through the National Council of Elders, uh, two organizations that are preserving the history of our struggles and sharing those with our younger activists. So I can see what's going on. You know, prior to COVID, I was out there with them. Uh, but now virtually we're still having meetings and all of that. And it's a very different landscape. I mean, you know, uh, we certainly had um, males in the leadership. They were the ones focused upon. And that has changed. And I'm glad to see it. And I think it's a very good thing. So I think it's, it's quite obvious, uh, you know, the voting rights, uh, the voting efforts in Georgia and in other places, you know, uh, black women were in the forefront of getting out the vote, uh, Latin, uh, Latino women, uh, Native American women. Uh, so, you know, we're, uh, women are largely responsible for the positive change that has happened here with the elections of 2020, thank goodness. Yes, absolutely. And back to when you were, you know, first getting involved in SNCC, how was the cost of, you know, your participation different from that of your brothers in arms? Well, I certainly, you know, had to go up against uh, a lot of opposition beginning in my own family. Uh, so I had no support. Uh, from my parents, from my grandmother, who was the principal uh, parent in, in my life, uh, they were absolutely adamant 
that I was not to get involved and they tried to do everything they could to prevent it. Uh, and as a student at Spelman, you know, Spelman had a view that, you know, Spelman women uh, are not to be marching and going to jail. And I was, uh, you know, punished for my activism and several times threatened with expulsion, uh, also threatened to have my um, full scholarship taken away, which would have been the end uh, of any college uh, uh, for me at that point. So it was, uh, you know, there was a struggle uh, for lots of us to be involved. Uh, it, we were not seen as uh, people who should be in the forefront of the movement at that time. Wow, that's amazing to hear that it was a global experience, you know, and, and probably yes. around similar times. What was going on in 1969? Um, Bill, maybe if you can share, um, I know it was Woodstock in um, in the US. You guys must have been really busy, um, but, uh, but what did, what were you hearing? Because one of the only newspaper reports on this trial was in the New York Times, um, apart from the, uh, the UK um, um, legal representation um, documenting it. The, the one of the only articles was in the New York Times or around the, the arrest and detention of uh, the woman and the torture which came afterwards? Well, you know, in, in the US um, at that time, the you had to really dig to get good information, reliable information on what was going on in South Africa, except at uh, the level of the uh, noted heroes. Uh, like Mandela. So um, we heard almost nothing about the struggles of women in South Africa or the women leaders. Um, and, and this was, but this wasn't just unique to South Africa. If you look at most of the national liberation struggles that were going on at that time, uh, what was held in front of us were the various courageous men uh, and then every so often you get a sense that uh, it, it was more complicated. Um, when I noticed things really changing was actually in the context of the Nicaraguan revolution, when the role of women was much more public. I mean, in, in, in Vietnam, we knew that there were women soldiers. But the, in, in the case of the Nicaraguan revolution, there was this different sort of sense of the role of women and the change that was underway. Um, in the United States, our movement um, has always been a movement that has uh, needed and has had black women at its core. Um, and, but up until relatively recently, uh, they were not treated as leaders, as Dr. Simmons is talking about. Um, you know, even when you'd have organizations that'd be majority women, there would be men that would be leading. And it wasn't just men that were advancing the men as leaders. There was this patriarchal hierarchy that was encouraged. Um, and it was, it was a very strong ideological current. Uh, and and had to be had to be taken on, and we saw that in the um, Black Panther Party. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't appreciate is that I think that black women were the majority of party members, and they were certainly the key force in the party. But you, with certain rare exceptions, you associate the Black Panther Party with certain men that were leading it. And, and so over the years, we've been breaking with that. But there's also been pushback. And, and I'm talking about now, uh, where you, you have, I don't know whether this is true in South Africa, but you have men that are arguing that they've been displaced. And I think that we saw some of this show up in this election, uh, the presidential election, in terms of the... Um, uh, men, African-American men and 
uh, Latino men, not overwhelmingly, but that that started switching towards Trump. And I think that it had to do with there was a certain appeal to appeal from Trump's misogyny. And this is going to be something that we're going to have to take up going forward. Thank you. And I'm really interested in, in what you said, Bill, about men assuming leadership. And I, I wonder, Shantini, if you can speak to, you know, what happened to these women in the first democratic South African government? You know, how, how were they included or excluded? Um, you know, I can't, we, we, we yet to have a female president in South Africa. I think that's quite telling. Um, at the same time, um, there was a really interesting thing that happened when Nelson Mandela was freed, for instance, and with a number of the, the banned and exiled activists, is that their relationships didn't last. Um, and, you know, um, Muni and Nelson Mandela divorced shortly after he was released and um, he remarried later on. Um, and in terms of government structures, there were, there still are many women um, and, you know, rep there, there is representation. It's still in the minority. Um, the ANC also had a women's league, which was really a bit of a strange phenomenon um, to them split up, you know, the party along gender lines when it was exactly what you can see from the trial, um, it was definitely um, a very integrated movement at the time. Um, as much as it was still difficult for women to be involved, I mean, you know, there was this was a time when people were getting used to women wearing trousers um, in, in around the world, I think, maybe, um, and um, d definitely in South Africa. And where women were very much seen as the caregivers and, and things like that. But um, despite the contribution, and like I said, Winnie Mandela was seen as the, the mother of our nation. She was um, the face of the struggle movement in many ways while the exiled leaders were away. So you would have expected perhaps um, for her to play a more central role and perhaps it was the personal um, circumstances. There was also you know, like I said, some militant activity um, when the struggle became an armed struggle. And a lot of that might have influenced why she didn't play a bigger role. Um, and I think it's representative again of, of many other women, but later on, she actually um, moved on a little bit from the ANC, which was her political home um, and, and, and almost um, created a a more economic um, sort of a rebellion party, which is still in existence now in South Africa. Um, so it tells you a little bit about how welcoming and how women were viewed, um, even if they were activists by um, the people of South Africa and also about um, in the government structures. Thank you. Um, Zohara, I'm hoping you can maybe speak to how you first connected to the anti-apartheid solidarity movement here in the US. Well, uh, you know, those of us who were in SNCC, we were always uh, very, very interested in the liberation movements uh, and when I went to work for the American Friends Service Committee uh, in 1971, uh, it already had a major uh, South African uh, program. And uh, Michael Simmons uh, was the uh, director of it for a number of years. We had Bill Sutherland, who was based in uh, Tanzania as our Southern Africa representative. Uh, and so we, you know, through being a staff person at AFSC, you know, we were constantly learning about what was happening on the ground. And uh, one of the things that Bill Sutherland did was to arrange for speakers of uh, people in exile to come uh, 
to the US and Michael would set up speaking tours across the country uh, for them. So this is how I got involved. And we had a, a very active uh, group in Philadelphia, in the community, uh, primarily African-American uh, people who were very involved in the anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, you know, Black people could relate to uh, what apartheid meant on the ground, even though, uh, because we had just recently <laughs> been able to make Jim Crow uh, illegal. And while, you know, many Black people lived all over the country, most of them had relatives who lived in the South. And so they had been home to visit grandmothers and aunts and uncles, and they knew how life was. So, you know, we were just outraged that in Africa, uh, in a majority African country, uh, you know, that white people had set themselves up uh, to rule by the gun and basically to kill and torture black people who fought for their human and civil rights. So, you know, it was just no question in my mind and in many, many people's minds that we were going to put pressure on the United States government to put pressure on the South African government to change things. Thank you. And what were some highlights of your participation in the international solidarity movement? Well, you know, I was hoping that you were going to direct that to Bill, who had so much more of a role nationally. Well, then let's, nationally let's cue him in. And then I did. But, you know, we, we certainly, um, you know, demonstrated if there was going to be a demonstration. Uh, you know, as I said, uh, much of the work locally uh, was, you know, raising funds. Uh, we had a number of South African exiles that lived in the Philadelphia area that we helped to support and arrange speaking uh, engagements for them and the like. Uh, so, you know, letter writing, petitions, uh, these were the things that I was involved in with the local group and then through AFSC, uh, certainly helping uh, through what was called the Third World Coalition of the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, you know, sometimes we had to pressure AFSC to do more, uh, particularly with its New York office at the UN and its offices in Washington, D.C., uh, the Friends Committee on National Legislation. So we were working on, you know, many fronts uh, because of the uh, association there with the American Friends Service Committee. I think one of the great things that uh, the project did was to engage working class Black people uh, in the struggle against apartheid. And, you know, a lot of people were somewhat surprised at the workers, uh, you know, in Shreveport, Louisiana, and in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, the unionized black workers. That was one of the groups that Michael Simmons focused on in his organizing the anti-apartheid work. And so uh, this, uh, you know, it was easy to get black people organized to put pressure on our government to uh, stop supporting the apartheid government. Thank you. So Bill, can you speak to your work in the international solidarity movement? <laughs> so um, I was a minor character. I was a foot soldier in the movement. Um, I got involved as a kid, essentially. Um, because in my family, on both sides of my family, very progressive overall. And we'd have regular discussions and debates about world events. And, and the issue of South Africa, of the, the Portuguese colonies, of what was then Rhodesia, et cetera. This was something that we were always talking about. Um, 
And I, I think, you know, my personal evolution starts with reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, but then being influenced by the Black Panther Party. And so it was in the Black Panther paper that many of us were able to learn much more about what was, what was going on in these different national liberation struggles. Trying to figure out what to do about them, however, was much more complicated. Um, and But in the 1970s, there were movements that started that were focused on divestment. Uh, divesting, uh, you know, companies and organizations divesting from various institutions that were doing business with the Portuguese or the South Africans or the Rhodesians, et cetera. Um, and I became engaged with that, as well as doing uh, a lot of educational work. One of the big controversies in the United States was how to relate to the multiple liberation organizations in South Africa. And there was a high degree of sectarianism that existed. Uh, those of us that were close to the Pan-Africanist Congress were often chastised. Um, then you'd have the Azanian People's Organization as well as the ANC. And this made things very complicated in, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, the, uh, I, I got involved in the 80s in a lot of the labor work that was developing. And there were these sort of parallel movements in the labor, in, in organized labor around uh, the anti-apartheid struggle as well as around US policy in the Central American wars. And there was a struggle to shift labor away from its sort of pro-US foreign policy, pro-CIA orientation. And I was a minor uh, cog in that wheel. Um, the, after Nelson Mandela was freed, the, and, and apartheid started to collapse, there was a, a real challenge that we faced here about uh, our, the relationship with the liberation movement in South Africa. Um, and there, was some, there were very significant problems that took place uh, and uh, that, that played themselves out in terms of the support movement here feeling like they were kicked aside by the ANC. Um, Randall Robinson, who was my predecessor at Trans Africa, and was an incredible leader and uh, played a major role in the setting up of the Free South Africa movement, uh, was treated very badly initially by the ANC. Um, after, and, and uh, you know, while the damage was repaired later, it's a phenomenon that I've seen with a number of national liberation movements that have won that they have pushed aside their supporters in the United States. And that leads to some levels of bitterness and cynicism. Uh, so I took over Trans Africa after Randall Robinson, but it was a completely different strategic moment. And, um, and that would be a lot for another story. And we can do that in a different interview. Thank you. And I, I think we have a, a question from our audience that uh, relates to what you've been talking about, Bill. You saw it for a second. How important was the divestment campaign against apartheid? It was very important. It was a global campaign. And it was a campaign that was, that the ANC and that other liberation forces uh, encouraged, you know, uh, and, and that becomes very, very important for people to get that, uh, that it wasn't us in the United States imposing our will on the South Africans. The South African movement was saying, this is something that needs to be done. But it was not like you just turned on a light and it happened. This was a movement that had to be built over time. And there were counter forces, including in the black movement, around this. There were those that said that uh, divestment and boycott was going to hurt the South African people. 
And this was something the, the Leon Sullivan was one of the architects of that view. Um, and we're basically looking for the South African uh, economy to change and act better. Um, but then you had something that was even worse that appeared in the 1980s when uh, Ronald Reagan became the president. And it turned out that there, were the, there was a very right-wing religious movement within a section of Black America that was anti-communist, was pro-UNITA, the group in, in Angola, um, was very anti-ANC and anti-PAC. Um, and these people appeared out of nowhere like cockroaches in the middle of the night. And they, it, was, it was completely surprising uh, because you know, there was just this general assumption that Black America was of course gonna be supportive of the right side in South Africa. And all of a sudden, these people appear um, almost by magic. And they weren't, and the thing to understand is that they weren't simply creatures of the CIA. This, there is a segment of Black America that is very right wing. And we often don't want to acknowledge that and struggle openly against it. But they appeared in the 1980s and they were trying to push back. They were defeated, but they're still there. Wow. That's really fascinating, Bo. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Yeah, in fact, I was wondering, Shantani, if you could speak a little bit more about how this international action against apartheid was, was felt from within South Africa. Well, um, I wasn't there at the time, but obviously the, you know, <laughs> the, sanctions, the sanctions and the, the pressure from uh, outside South Africa, I mean, if you think about apartheid, it was actually, it's a, such a ridiculous notion. It's the same as thinking of um, some, like how we almost regard slavery now. It's, it's so um, fundamentally against any form of um, human rights um, to live that way, um, that the rest of the world had to shun this country and kind of isolate it. Um, so that it would, um, you know, to, to try and, and, and put this pressure on the government. So definitely the effects, they, they were, um, you know, um, hiccups in the, depending on who was in government at, uh, at, in, at whatever stage. But, you know, um, from the superpowers, from the, um, the movements outside, and al also knowing that a lot of our exiled leaders were in, in, Central parts of the world, like the, like London and New York, and things like that, um, definitely put pressure on the, on the the South African government. And it, together with our um, personal um, struggle movement that was going on here, you know, it like I said, it became an armed struggle. The country was on the on the verge of um, um, a, a, there was civil war basically going on, and. Um, all of this collectively made the government at the time realize that they, it wasn't sustainable, which is why they started the negotiations to to release Nelson Mandela and the um, the and unban the ANC. Um, so definitely, it was a collective effort to highlight the the um, the, the ridiculousness of of the apartheid movement and and you know how it survived for such a long time is. Um, it's remarkable in itself, but um, all that work over and and you know, a bull called himself a foot soldier. The women in the story are also foot soldiers. They're all smaller parts of a really big um, movement that that is made up of very ordinary people who who, if they hadn't played their part, we wouldn't be here today talking about this. So um, it's definitely you know the foot soldiers who don't give up even even though the the, the struggle is that long. Thank you. And speaking to the, the sacrifices of these women, uh, has the South African government made any effort to support them physically, financially, emotionally, given the suffering that they've undergone? Um, you know, this was an interesting thing um, to, to think about, even for me while writing the book, because women surviving apartheid prisons, I think the biggest thing that I took away from this is that these women were 
absolutely humble, but also very disciplined, which I think um, Dr. Simmons and Bill would will recognize from the activism of that time. There was no social media to talk about their exploits. There was they had to operate from a place of secrecy. So the less said, the better. And um, they didn't expect anything afterwards. Um, there were, uh, you know, small sort of pension funds um, which were given to to veterans. Um, but they live very, very ordinary lives, these women, and many, many of the, the activists who were involved in the movement too, who didn't, you know, end up working in government and things like that. Although they were very involved in the unions and did um, continue to do some work around unions as well. And Marita is the only one of the four um, who um, worked in, in the South African government um, under several presidents. But um, at the same time, still lives in her humble home in Soweto. You know, it's it's never. Um, it, they were given certificates by the South African government. Um, one of uh, one of the awards, unfortunately, spelt Manondwe's name incorrectly, which really tells you about how um, how they were recognized. So I really believe, you know, this is was part of the reason for sharing the story was to to recognize them and and the others that are unnamed, whose names we don't say. Absolutely, thank you. And this uh, sort of brings brings me back to one of our past conversations where we talked about, you know, women's activism as as women's work work that is that is you know, sort of unpaid and silent, but absolutely crucial. And I, I wonder if Zohara, um, if you can speak to that a little bit, if that means anything to you. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, certainly women, as we have been saying throughout our conversation, um, women have played such strategic roles um, in the town where I worked in Mississippi, uh, in Laurel, Mississippi, which had no infrastructure, nothing. Um, I arrived there with some names of, of people to knock on their doors to say, would you like to have a project here to work on voter registration, et cetera? And I lucked up because one of the first doors I knocked on was this woman named Eberta Spinks. And, uh, you know, I was like uh, 19 years old, had no idea how you asked somebody, can I move in with you? And, you know, your house may be bombed and uh, you're going to lose, your husband will probably lose his job. But nonetheless, would you take me in? And, you know, she looked at me and she said, are you a freedom rider? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, I've been waiting on you all my life. Come in. And she was a woman in her early 50s. And she was the backbone and the beginning of a movement there in Laurel, Mississippi that was very successful. But she wanted no, uh, you know, whenever I wanted her to speak or whatever her thing was, oh, no, no, no. She was a background person. And, uh, you know, there were many women like that in the movement. Uh, and uh, women have played and continue to play. I think now they are getting the recognition to some extent and are letting the world know that they are leaders and they have vision and that they are carrying these visions out. But as Bill noted, because of patriarchy, a lot of our women in the movements of the 60s, uh, they were kind of shy about being seen as leaders, even though that's exactly what they were. Thank you. I wonder if you want to cue in a little bit more here, Bill. Um, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and the, um, the, there is this, this patriarchal view um, it plays itself out in a number of different ways, including who is supposed to be legitimately a leader. And, and so the, the, uh, the tendency to look towards male religious figures, for example, as being the leaders of the community. Um, and, and so we, we 
we have this end up, this ends up being reinforced time and again. Um, but the bottom line is that it's been changing and it's been changing through a lot of struggle, some of which has been very painful within the movement. Um, and uh, because, it, because you're really talking about altering roles, uh, changing assumptions. And, and one of the things you can see internationally, and it was true in the United States, is that during many uh, struggles for independence and national liberation, uh, various sectors of the population were told to put their demands on hold until after national liberation. So workers were told, well, you know, don't push too hard until we get rid of the Europeans. So women were told, you know, yeah, this is an issue of male supremacy is important, but we'll deal with it later. And I think that what we found is that you can't separate contradictions like that, um, that they, they interact. And, and so this idea of putting certain things on hold um, is sort of like holding or trying to hold a bubble underwater. It, it just, it won't work. And when it comes up, it comes up sometimes in the most inconvenient moments. So um, I think that this has resulted in many changes within the movements internationally. Um, Unfortunately, there's also been uh, in part influenced by the growth of postmodernism, those that try to segment struggles and look at them all as very specific to a particular sector and that you can't arrive at any kind of universal principles. Um, and that includes, you know, when, when we're talking about how to support internationally struggles against patriarchy. And there are those that say, no, you shouldn't. Because if you're not South African, how dare you criticize the way women are treated in South Africa? Or if you're not Iranian, how dare you criticize the way women are treated in Iran? And it comes down to only whales can critique Moby Dick. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And so I think that there's an internationalism that, that really is important and, and it makes this discussion today on International Women's Day so vital. Absolutely, thank you. And I think, I think there's some really interesting transnational links to be drawn between anti-racist and anti-colonial struggles. Some are, are quite painful. Um, in her book, Shantani describes apartheid agents as coming to South Africa, having practiced uh, their interrogation techniques in, in Algeria um, previously. But I, I, I wonder, and this is a, quite a personal, uh, personally motivated question, um, but what kind of links with or, or inspiration from uh, was there with, with the FLN struggle in Algeria to, to anyone? So the you know, I think I have to frame it a little bit in terms of these, um, the, the, the main sort of torturers of the women were security branch police um, officials who were, you know, um, just brutal in their, in their interrogation of, of women and men um, very gendered um, torture as well. Um, and you can imagine what they are. It's detailed in the book. And, and many activists we know lost their lives. People were thrown from buildings um, while they were interrogated. Um, so the links to Algeria, I know it's very, very close to your heart, but um, Amel, the, the, the difficulty with that one is that the um, South African apartheid government sent these um, security branch policemen to Algeria to be trained in interrogation techniques by the French, who had obviously done the same to Algerians. And, um, you know, they learned torture methods, which are detailed in the book, which which they sort of, um, interestingly, it was between the two important trials that I mentioned. So 
while the Rivonia trialists had been already detained and, um, you know, in uh, on, on Robben Island, the famous island prison here, um, between the time of that imprisonment and the the 1969 trial was when the um, security branch had spent time in Algeria learning these torture techniques. And it was really to get information out of people. Um, you know, some of it was very, um, um, it, the mental torture was, was almost worse than the physical torture, as the women would say. Um, they were meant to stand on bricks for days on end. In fact, Shanti Naidu spent five days um, without sleep. And when she was hallucinating, spoke about um, what had happened, um, something which she dreamt, uh, you know, she mentioned flying in, and she actually hadn't been on, a, on an airplane in that, at that time. But they, um, the security officers wrote this down as her statement to um, which they put before court. And, you know, this is when it was disputed. And, um, you know, I, I think the interesting part of this, this whole story is that despite everything that had happened, despite the really um, planned and very, um, you know, intentional um, torture and, and interrogation of these women that they, they didn't ever um, let their comrades down, even though they didn't know them. So. Um, the that Algerian connection is something that Shanti Naidu talks about in the book, and um, you know even now at eighty five years old, um, still remembers um, how the how brutal that that time was. So yeah, I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Um, so Hara, I, I know that you were uh, head of the Quaker delegation at the fourth. World Conference on Women in Beijing. And I, I was wondering if maybe you could speak to some of the power of, of transnational women's solidarity. Oh, yes, that was an incredible uh, gathering. Uh, the NGO forum, uh, you know, and of course, many people who might have learned about what happened uh, when all of the women from around the world uh, converged, you know, the Chinese put us all out in a small town called Waru, which was about 30 or 40 miles outside of Beijing. Uh, and they, you know, they were not happy that we were there. You know, they wanted to host the UN gathering, but they did not want the NGO gathering that came along with it. Uh, so, you know, to have 40,000 women from every continent, from every country, uh, all of whom were activists uh, in their local communities and all, and just in spite of the hardship that we faced physically uh, due to the lack of um, accommodations, uh, you know, they were not really prepared for us. And then we had terrible weather. In spite of that, we gathered uh, from, you know, and I just went around meeting women from everywhere, hearing their stories uh, of the organizing that they were doing uh, to change, to make life better for women in their particular part of the world. It was phenomenal. And then I also, of course, was a delegate to the to the UN gathering in Beijing, uh, which was also, you know, inspiring and moving. And I know I came back feeling uh, so uh, enthused uh, about the possibilities for the rights of women around the world. And all these years later, you know, we're still struggling. I mean, we still have the violence against women. We still have so many things uh, that we are fighting against and fighting for. But that was an incredible experience to be a part of the um, UN Fourth Conference on Women in Beijing. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's probably time for us to, to wrap it up here, but I, I wanna thank you all for this.
really incredible conversation and, and for creating this very special space. So thank you, Shantani, Bill, and Zohara for everything you've shared with us today. Um, Thanks. Yes, I'd also like to invite the audience um, to visit Just World Educational's online learning hub on women in the South African struggle against apartheid, which features resources and videos, including an online reunion that was held with the four women of the book uh, in November. And I'd like to remind everyone uh, that Women Surviving Apartheid Prisons is available for pickup from either the Busboys and Poets 14th and V or Tacoma Park uh, or online at bookshop.org. And thank you so much to Patrick and everyone at Busboys and Poets for creating this space for us. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amel. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. It's been fascinating. Thank it has much. been. Thank you. Thank you for the book. I love it. Thank you. Exactly.